good evening friends and for a change on a weekday we are having a webinar at around 5:30 but once you have a good speaker amongst you it is always better when the mind is fresh after relaxing from the quotas one should listen to the speaker amongst us today we have mr surit parthasarthi an eminent lawyer and who is a product of njus kolkata and he is not only a renowned lawyer but is also an avid writer and his articles and write ups have been published in different publications he is a regular contributor to the hindu newspaper on the op-ed page and he is also been writing for karva magazine the open magazine the indian express the economic and political weekly and the websites of new york the atlantic and the new york times and he has been delivering his talks on different perspectives of income tax as well as constitution today we have a topic which as a student of law and as a lawyer we invariably are keeping and discussing the stock of india's federal structure and doctrine of repugnancy of constitution of india and we found that there couldn't be a better speaker who can give insights on a topic which has been there always been the relevance of this topic as to what is the federal structure and what is the do doctrine of repugnancy and without taking much time i would request uh, surit to take over and give the insights of this topic which everyone is looking upon here uh thank you uh, mr vikas chatrit uh, thank you to the organizers uh, very good evening to all of you it's a pleasure to be speaking to all of you today over the course of the next uh, 40 to 50 minutes or so i hope to uh, provide to all of you an overview of the provisions of the constitution that divide legislative responsibilities between parliament and the state legislatures and more particularly <clears throat> on those provisions that elucidate the consequences when laws made by a state legislature conflict with a law made by parliament in areas where both bodies possess competence but uh, before we get to all of that we need to begin by understanding the basic framework that the constitution has put in place for governance in our country we know that constitutions around the world are classified often as either federal or unitary in nature in india we've had plenty of debate on how our constitution is to be classified going back to the 1963 decision in state of west bengal versus union of india but by now it is rather well settled that federalism that is the federal character of the constitution is one of its basic features it is therefore a feature that cannot be altered even by way of a constitutional amendment now having said that the question that then arises is this what does a federal constitution in fact do and specifically what does the indian constitution do in terms of creating and shaping a federal scheme <clears throat> what the indian constitution does is to provide two layers of government a government at the level of the center or the union which has powers to administer the entirety of the territory of india <clears throat> and a government at the level of the states which is vested with the power to administer the territory demarcated under its jurisdiction now we all know that article 1 of the constitution states that india that is bharat shall be a union of states and we now know after the judgment in keshav nand bharati that this article is effectively unamendable now, a series of judgments since then uh, significantly the judgment in sr bombay's case have made it clear that federalism is indeed a basic feature of the constitution and it cannot be altered even by way of a constitutional amendment now of course in india after the 73rd and 74th constitutional amendments we also have a third layer of government 
That is one at the level of the Panchayat Raj, at the village and municipality level. But this third layer remains largely within the realm of state control. Now, of course, we can debate over how much power should be vested in that third layer, but that calls perhaps for a separate session altogether. The other aspect that we must bear in mind when we are discussing federalism is the actual division of powers and responsibilities. Now, this sharing of power is very intricately laid out in the Constitution. And this is quite important for the purposes of our session today. The first provision to keep in mind is Article 245 of the Constitution, which provides the territorial jurisdiction of the Union Parliament and the state legislatures. Article 245 stipulates broadly that Parliament can make laws for the whole of the Union of India or any part of it. And it also says that the state legislature can make laws for the territory of that state or for any part of that state. The next provision to keep in mind is Article 246. Now, Article 246, we need to read in conjunction with Schedule 7 of the Constitution. What Article 246 says is that Parliament will have exclusive power to make laws over all those subjects that are enumerated in List 1, which is contained in the 7th Schedule. Now, List 1 contains subjects such as the Defense of India, arms and explosives, foreign affairs, citizenship, intellectual property, railways, banking, and so forth. Article 246 then says that insofar as those subjects that are contained in this two is concerned, it is the state government and the state legislatures alone that shall have the power to legislate. Well, list two contains again various subjects, essentially of local importance, such as police, public order, public health and sanitation, agriculture, fisheries, and so forth. <clears throat> the third thing that Article 246 makes clear is that in so far as matters that are contained in the third list is concerned, which is the concurrent list, both parliament and the state legislatures will have jurisdiction to make legislation. Now, this concurrent list has subjects such as criminal law, protection of wild animals, acquisition of property, factories, electricity, and so forth. One other thing that we might want to bear in mind at this juncture is that entry 97 of list one makes clear that parliament will have exclusive residuary power to make laws on any subject which are not otherwise contained in any of the three lists. Now I'll come to the question of repugnancy shortly when laws made by the state conflict with a law made by parliament. But for now, what we need to keep in mind is that there is a similar division of responsibility that is placed insofar as executive and judicial powers is concerned as well. Executive powers of these governments runs broadly coterminous with these legislative powers. Similarly, financial powers are very intricately divided. This is again uh, gleaned out by a reading of Article 246 together with lists one and two of Schedule 7. Taxing subjects are not contained in this three, but again, this is there's an intricate division made on taxing powers between list one and two. But uh, there's been some change on that on account of GST, but again, we won't get into that for the purposes of today's session. So what we have, therefore, is a constitution that clearly delineates powers and responsibilities. And in laying down this framework and in laying down this sort of division of responsibility, it creates a federal scheme of governance. Now, how that scheme is to be interpreted when conflicts arise is, of course, to be determined on a proper reading of the text of the Constitution and, where necessary, by looking into the history of the Constitution's making. For our purposes today, there are two aspects that broadly bear consideration. The first aspect is the issue of competence. That is the question of when a particular legislature is competent to enact a law. And the second aspect is the question of repugnance. That is, what happens when a state law conflicts with a central law. Now, it's very important to note at the very outset here that these two are distinct issues. The Supreme Court has unfortunately conflated them at times, which I think has led to substantial confusion. But we must recognize that they are two separate and distinct issues. Now, before I proceed further on this, I just want to make a recommendation, which is a chapter in the Oxford Handbook of the Indian Constitution written by V. Niranjan, 
which for those of us who are interested in learning about this subject in far greater detail than the constraints of a lecture of this kind might allow is, you know, bears sort of reading. So to understand this distinction between competency and repugnancy, we must again start with what the constitution itself says. As I said, there are three provisions that are important for this purpose, two of which we already saw, which are articles 245 and 246. The other provision is article 254 of the constitution. These three provisions broadly correspond to what was contained in sections 100 and 107 of the Government of India Act of 1935. Now, it's worth bearing in mind that this division of power that the Constitution adopted is largely and substantively derived from the division of power that was made between the federal and the provincial governments under the 1935 Government of India Act. So some of the decisions rendered by high courts at the time and by the Privy Council in appeals emanating out of those decisions continue to remain relevant. Indeed, I would argue that they offer greater clarity in comparison with some of the Supreme Court decisions on the subject that have since followed. Now, we already saw again what Article 245 says, which is that Parliament will have power to make laws for the whole or any part of the territory of India, and the state legislature will have power to make laws for the, <clears throat> those territories that are contained within the state or any part of that state. Article 246 Again, we saw in terms of division of responsibility between parliament and state legislature. In, and in so far as the division of power is made through the three lists that are contained in the seventh schedule. Article 254, which deals with repugnancy, broadly states, and there are two clauses here. The first clause says that if there is any legislation or any provision of law that is made by a state legislature, which is repugnant to a provision of law made by parliament, which parliament was competent to enact, then subject to what clause two says, <clears throat> it is the parliamentary law that will prevail, whether that parliamentary law was made before the state law <clears throat> or after the state law. <clears throat> 254 clause two says that where a law is made by a state legislature, with respect to one of the matters that is contained in the concurrent list, that is the third list in Schedule 7. And if it is repugnant to any provisions of an earlier law made by Parliament or an existing law with respect to that matter, then the legislation made by the state legislature will prevail if it has been reserved for the consideration of the President and if it has received the assent of the President. Provided, however, that Parliament is always at liberty to once again make a fresh law, either amending, varying, or even repealing the law made by the state legislature. So this is the broad provisions of the uh, constitution in so far as the subject is concerned. Now, when we study, and I'll come and uh, come to sort of the finer intricacies of these, uh, of the text of these provisions shortly. What we must recognize at the state is that when we study the distribution of legislative power in federal constitutions around the world, where power is divided by one constitution between two different layers of government, such as the Canadian constitution, the Australian constitution, the Indian constitution, or for that matter, the Government of India Act. What we'll see is that the power is given generally to make laws in relation to or in respect of certain topics. This is the kind of language that is used in relation to or in respect of. Now, both these terms broadly tend to have the same meaning, but there is a difference between a law made in respect of a subject and a law that simply affects the subject matter. And this distinction is borne out well by a judgment of the Privy Council in Lador versus Bennett, which is 1939 Appeals Cases 468. Now, this is a case that arose out of Canada, where the challenge was to a Two, to two pieces of legislation, one the City of Windsor Amalgamation Act and the Amending Act of the Ontario Provincial Legislature. What these laws did was to create, was basically what was happening was there were four municipalities in Canada which were facing financial difficulties. So these laws basically amalgamated them into one law as the City of Windsor. And a scheme was framed under that act 
and the amounts which were due as principal and interest by the municipalities were allowed to be scaled down under the act. The petitioners before the court, before the Privy Council, they argued that it was only the Parliament of Canada that could make laws in relation to interest and therefore this law was invalid because it lacked competence. Lord Atkins sitting on the Privy Council rejected this contention. He held that the provincial government had the power to make laws relating to incorporation of a new municipality and this was what the law related to. Any effect that this law might have had on insolvency or on rates of interest was merely incidental in nature. So therefore he said in pith and substance, and we'll come to these words again, pith and substance, that in pith and substance, this law related to the making of a municipality and not to interest. And therefore, the provincial government had the power to make this law. Now, in the Indian Constitution, Article 246 uses very similar words. It uses the words with respect to. So what this means is that when a legislature makes a law and when that law is read as a whole, you see that that law is with respect to a certain subject on which the legislature is competent to make a law, then that law will not suffer from a lack of competence. It would not be ultra vires merely because there are certain provisions in it that might encroach on subjects over which the legislature concerned might not have otherwise possessed competence. Therefore, when a parliamentary law over which parliament has competence conflicts with a state law over which a state legislature also has competence, the way to resolve that muddle is by looking at Article 254 and applying the doctrine of repugnancy. But what really should have been this simple has proved anything but, and we'll see that from some of the decisions delivered by the Supreme Court. But under the Government of India Act, at least under the 1935 Government of India Act, this was the position that was broadly adopted. And there was a reasonable amount of lucidity to some of those decisions at the time. Let's first consider one of the sort of landmark litigations that arose with respect to this point of competence and repugnancy under the 1935 Government of India. The first of these litigation concerned money lending laws which were made at the time. Now money lending and money lenders was a subject that had been placed in the provincial list. And the provincial list is basically the list which is anal analogous to the state list under the Indian constitution. Promissory notes and banking on the other hand was placed in the federal list. Now, what we must recognize also at this juncture is that those provisions of the Government of India Act were largely in pari materia with what the Constitution today states. But we can see already with the placing of these subjects in these two lists, that is the placing of promissory notes as a subject over which the federal legislature has competence and the placing of money lending and money lenders under the provincial list, you can already see that it is quite plausible for both these legislatures to make valid laws governing, for example, the rate of interest that might be payable, let's say, on a promissory note. And indeed, that is precisely the controversy that happened. And this is exactly what transpired. Because the provincial legislatures in the Madras and Calcutta governments, of the Madras and Calcutta governments at the time, they passed laws governing agricultural loans, which, had, which happened to be secured by promissory notes. And the federal legislature made a law that dealt with promissory notes, which incidentally happened to involve agriculture. Now, a bare reading of these two laws showed that both the provincial government and the federal government had made valid laws. They were both competently enacted. So how is this conflict going to be settled? Now, the first decision is a full bench decision of the Madras High Court in Nagaratnam versus Seshaya. Now, in that case, the Madras Agricultural Debt Relief Act which stipulated that a court was permitted to scale down a debt that was owed to a money lender by an agriculturalist, whether the debt had ripened into a decree before the act or not. That was the broad stipulation that was contained in that act. The money lenders who went to the court, they submitted that this act was incompetent and invalid. And it was also repugnant to the Negotiable Instruments Act of 1881 which basically provided that the recipient of a negotiable instrument was liable to pay the amount on maturity according to the tenor of the instrument at, the, at whatever was the specified rate of interest. But there was clearly a uh, conflict and a clash between the two uh, enactments. 
Chief Justice Lionel Leach held that the Madras Act was intra virus in that the legislation was competently made. Now, this he arrived at by broadly adopting the doctrine of pith and substance. But eventually, I mean, this was not the decision that finally held the field. Eventually, there was a decision of the Privy Council in Prafulla Kumar Mukherjee of the federal, and of the federal court in Subramaniam Chettiar versus Muthuswami Gauntan, which is 1940 Federal Court Reports 188, which settled the controversy. Now, in the second case of these cases, that is in Subramaniam Chettiar's case, <clears throat> what happened is the money lender had obtained a decree on a promissory note, which the court, at the request of the borrower, the agriculturalist, had scaled down in accordance with what the provincial law permitted. The court basically said that this Canadian doctrine of pith and substance applied to India as well. This is because the word used in the Government of India Act was, as I said earlier, with respect to. So the court said that a mere incidental encroachment into another subject was not forbidden. Therefore, according to it, both the 1881 Negotiable Instruments Act, which regulated the rate of interest that was payable on a promissory note, and the Madras Act, which allowed the court to scale down a debt, were both intra virus. But the question of repugnance remained unanswered. Because the court said in this case, the decree had been obtained four years before the Madras law was even enacted. And therefore, they simply held that they didn't need to go into the question of repugnancy at this stage. But the Privy Council did have to go into the question of repugnancy in Prafulla Kumar Mukherjee's case. There, the question concerned a Bengal legislation, which was in pari materia with the Madras law. But in this case, the decree had been obtained after the commencement of the act. On competence, the Calcutta High Court had applied the doctrine of pith and substance. But what it did was a very strange thing. It said that an incidental encroachment into another subject may be acceptable, but the moment a substantial encroachment was made, the legislation would be ultra virus. Now, this really was a mistaken reading of the doctrine of pith and substance, because what Chief Justice Spence of the Calcutta High Court held was that the Bengal law, it didn't merely incidentally encroach into the 1881 Negotiable Instruments Act, but it made a substantial encroachment into that legislation and was therefore ultra virus the Government of India Act of 1935. But this is the classic conflation which I spoke about at the outset. This conflates the two tests of competence and repugnancy. Because what he wound up doing here effectively was to compare the state money lenders legislation with the central or with the federal legislation at the time, instead of essentially testing the legislation based on the legislative entry in question. So the Privy Council, however, reversed this holding. The court held, the Privy Council that is, that the only test for competence is to look into the true nature of the legislation, that is the pith and substance of the impugned act, and not these questions whether there was a substantial encroachment or an incidental encroachment. And it said that the true nature of the provincial legislation in this case is that it is an act that deals with money lenders. And therefore, regardless of whether it made a substantial encroachment or not into the Negotiable Instruments Act, it would be a valid piece of legislation. Now, this is insofar as competency is concerned. Of course, on repugnance, the court had to apply the test of repugnancy. And because the state law and the, that is the provincial law and the federal law occupied the same field, it had to hold that the provincial law could not be applied or would be void to that extent. Now, I'll come to this question of repugnancy in a little more detail shortly, but I just want to make clear that in so far as competency is concerned, the Privy Council could not have been any more lucid, even if it had wanted to. And even the Supreme Court, in its earliest cases, seemed to apply this test of competence, which was adopted by the Privy Council. For example, in State of Bombay versus Narottam Das Jethabai, which is AR 1951, Supreme Court 69, the Supreme Court there held that the Bombay City Civil Court Act was competently enacted and that it fell within the domain of the provincial legislature under entry 2, list 2, and that any encroachment that this law might have made on a federal subject that was enumerated in list 1 was merely incidental in nature and nothing more, and that the pith and substance of this legislation was something that fell within the domain of the state legislature. Now, this pith and substance test has also had many other names. The Supreme Court, for example, in State of Bombay versus F.N. Balsara, AR 1951, 
Supreme Court 318, when it was testing the validity of the Bombay Prohibition Act, it referred to the pith and substance test as the true nature and character test. But essentially, they're just two different names for the same test. What the court said in that case was that under entry 31 of list 2, the provincial legislature was allowed to pass any law which related to the production, manufacture, possession and sale of intoxicating liquor. And the law that was made by the provincial legislature at the time only prohibited possession and sale of liquor and it, it was argued that it encroached into a subject that was contained in, the, in list one which dealt with import and export across customs frontiers. But the court said that there might have been an encroachment there, but in pith and substance, in its true nature and character, the piece of legislation was attributable to entry 31 of list two. And therefore, it only incidentally trenched on a federal subject and that won't really matter. So the, according to it, the state government's competence would not be affected. What we have to understand here, though, is that a lot of this concerns a matter of interpretation, a matter of proper construction. Now, we can use these terms, pith and substance, true nature and character, etc. But ultimately, a court of law, when it's testing the competency of a legislature, will have to look at the entries in the lists, will have to then look, read the act as a whole, and try and see in pith and substance what entry this act can be equated to. So this is a matter, as I said, of construction. Now in India, we've had also some amount of confusion by what is known as the aspect theory, but we won't really get into that today in the interest of time. So to move, before I move on to repugnancy, I just want to reiterate one, one more time that the virus of a law, insofar as its competency is concerned, is dependent on the doctrine of pith and substance. But now we come to the question of what happens when two laws that are equally valid, which are made by two competent legislatures, conflict with each other. What happens, for example, when, say, Parliament has made a law which is validly enacted under a subject that is contained in List 1, and that law conflicts with a law made by, the, let's say, the state of Rajasthan, which is also validly made? What happens then? Now, these situations are governed by the doctrine of repugnancy and by a reading of Article 254 of the Constitution. Now, why is this doctrine of repugnancy really necessary? Now, to see the necessity for a doctrine of repugnancy and the necessity for Article 254, you can look at Chief Justice Guayar's judgment in Subramaniam Chetia's case, which I mentioned earlier, where he points out how it would be absurd if two inconsistent laws, each of equal validity, operated side by side within the same territory, which is why we need a theory of repugnance. But the unfortunate fact of the matter is that this theory of repugnancy and a reading of Article 254 has really suffered from some amount of confusion from the Supreme Court. Because even though this theory of repugnancy applies both to laws made under the state list and under the concurrent list, for some reason, the Supreme Court seems to have come to a conclusion that repugnancy merely concerns matters in the concurrent list. But this, but this really militates against a simple and bare reading of Article 254, Clause 1. Now, if you read Article 254, Clause 1, it is abundantly evident that whether it is a matter contained in the state list or in the concurrent list, if a piece of legislation which is competently made conflicts, that is, if a piece of state legislation conflicts with a piece of legislation made by parliament, it is the parliamentary law, parliamentary law alone that will prevail. But before I get into the questions over matters on the state list in, in a little bit more detail, we might want to look at how repugnancy is really tested, or rather, what is repugnancy? And there's a famous commentary on the Australian constitution by Nicholas, which uh, is cited by our own constitutional scholar H.M. Sivai in substantial depth, where Nicholas says that there are three tests of inconsistency or repugnancy. The first is that there may be inconsistency in the actual terms of the competing statutes. The second is that although there may be no direct conflict, a state law may be inoperative because the federal law, or the parliamentary law in this case, is intended to be a complete and exhaustive court. And the third test is that even in the absence of intention, 
a conflict may arise when both state and commonwealth seek to exercise their powers over the same subject matter. <clears throat> now, the Supreme Court in Deep Chand was a state of Uttar Pradesh, where Justice Subarav gave a ju uh, judgment, broadly accepted this test, which is framed by Nicholas in his commentary on the Australian Constitution. But the court here also recognized that a similar test was already placed by the Supreme Court in Zavir Bai Amaidas, was a state of Bombay, which is AR 1954, Supreme Court 752 where the Supreme Court had said that the principle embodied in Article 254 Clause 2 is that when there is a legislation covering the same ground both by the center and by the state, with both of them being competent to enact these legislation, it is the law of the center that should prevail over that of the state. So in deep chunks, the court held that repugnancy must broadly be ascertained on the following basis, which is firstly, you must see whether there is a direct conflict between the two provisions. Second, you must see whether Parliament intended to lay down an exhaustive code in respect to the subject matter replacing the act of the state legislature. And third, you must see whether Parliament, whether the law made by Parliament and the law made by the state legislature occupy the same field. So this broadly means that if a state law and a central law occupy the same field, even if the two laws may have been validly made, it is the central law alone that will prevail and the state law will, to the extent of its repugnancy, be void. Now, this, I would submit, applies both to matters in List 2 and List 3. And there is no distinction between the two. But I'll come to one Supreme Court judgment later, which seems to conflate these two for some reason. Now, what Article 154, Clause 1 also emphasizes is an idea of an implied repeal. And I want to touch upon this before I get into this conflation between List 2 and List 3. Now, what is this idea of an implied repeal? Now, Article 254, Clause 1 basically says that so long as there is a law that is made by Parliament, which is validly made, and so long as that is repugnant to a law made by a state legislature, the law made by Parliament will prevail. And it doesn't matter whether that law made by Parliament was before the state law or after the state law. Now, when a law is made by Parliament after the state law occupying the same field over which a state legislature had already made a law, and if both of these laws are competently enacted, the state law will be void to the extent of that repugnancy. And this I've made clear. Now, if such repugnancy is total in nature, in the sense that the state law is incapable of being operated, the state law will stand impliedly repealed. The central law need not explicitly say so. Let me just take an example. Let's say you have the Land Acquisition Act of 1894, which is made under the concurrent list. Then you have various state legislation amending the 1894 Act or bringing about their own legislation. Then in 2013, you have a law made by the central government which occupies the entire field of land acquisition, which basically says that henceforth acquisition of land, except in XYZ matters, shall be made under this right to fair compensation and transparency in land acquisition. Once that law is brought about, it doesn't matter whether that law impliedly repeals some amendment made to the law in uh, to the 1894 Act in the in, say by the state of Rajasthan or by the state of Maharashtra or special legislation for land acquisitions that might have been brought about by various states and of course various states have in fact brought about special legislation including states of Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, Haryana, etc. So all of those legislation will stand impliedly repealed. The effect of the Central Act will be to completely nullify the operation of the state legislation. It will be as though the state legislation was never enacted. Of course, there are certain exceptions to this, such as the rule contained in Section 6 of the General Clauses Act, but we don't need to get into that for the purposes of today's session. So this theory of implied repeal was made clear by the Supreme Court in State of Orissa versus M.A. Talak, which is A.R. 1964, Supreme Court 1284, where the court held that the entire theory which underlines this concept of implied repeal is that there is no need for the later enactment to state in express terms that an earlier enactment has been repealed. It is merely sort of a manifestation of the enactment of the new law. So a repeal can basically be brought about by repugnant legislation without even a reference to the act that is intended to be repealed. 
for once a legislature has competently made a law that is that is once parliament has competently enacted a law which is repugnant to the state legislation the state legislation to the extent of that repugnancy and if that repugnancy is total it will be completely void it will be impliedly repealed now there have been some subtleties added to these general principles you have the case of m karunanidhi versus union of india which is area 1979 supreme court 898 where justice fazil ali laid out a set of propositions on how this implied repeal will happen but uh, he basically said that the tamil nadu uh, public men criminal misconduct act and the ipc were not repugnant to each other because he said that there was some amount of room or possibility for both statutes to operate in the same field that the central law didn't completely occupy the field and therefore the state law was not impliedly repealed but once a state law is impliedly repealed where the state law is on the concurrent list then in my argument there is no way to revive that state law except by reenactment of that state law this is my argument i'll come to this argument and at the some contentions in so far as his argument is concerned but i'll come to that shortly but what we also see from article 24 254 clause 2 is that it makes clear that if parliamentary law occupies the field over an entry contained in this 3 and a state legislature makes a law on that subject then that state law can be validated if it has received the assent of the president and once it receives the assent of the president that law will prevail in the state in question now we've seen again this in the case of land acquisition legislation repeatedly over the years but a reading of article 254 clause 2 also makes it clear that this is available only in the case of a law made by a state legislature which is repugnant to an existing or earlier law made by parliament this means that once a law becomes dead by virtue of the operation of the doctrine of repugnancy and by the virtue by virtue of operation of article 254 clause 1 then it cannot under any circumstances be revived except through reenactment there are some supreme court authorities for this proposition but the clearest really is a judgment of the delhi high court a full bench judgment in pl mehra versus dr khanna ar 1971 delhi page 1 where justice hardeyal hardi hardi holds that a dead law can only be resuscitated through reenactment now i can take the example for example uh, uh, i can take the example of the tamil nadu law on land acquisition but uh, broadly what has happened is and this is a case that is sub judis before the supreme court but where a law was made by after the enactment of the 2013 uh, central enactment the right to fair compensation act all of these tamil nadu laws basically stood impliedly repealed but there was an effort made to revive them by including them in the fifth schedule of this 2013 act and thereby save their operations but the madras high court has taken a view that this cannot be done because the law became dead on the enactment of the 2013 legislation and that therefore the only way to do this is by uh, reenactment and uh, thereafter securing the assent of the president but that judgment is on appeal to the supreme court and is pending there so we don't need to get into that uh, for today's purposes but one other point that i want to make in the context of article 254 is that we must see that the words that are used in article 254 is the words made by the legislature so it doesn't really and this is clear from a reading of two judgments of the supreme court uh, one in uh, pandit rishikesh versus salma begum which is a three judge bench judgment in 1995 for supreme court page 718 and state of kerala versus marapram kuri which, which is a bench constitution bench judgment in 2012 7 scc 106 where what the supreme court has made clear is that as soon as a parliamentary law is made even if it hasn't come into force the theory of repugnancy will arise so just let's just take an example let's say there is a state law that is prevailing today and is occupying the field let's say in the state of maharashtra tomorrow and that's a matter in the concurrent list tomorrow parliament enacts and passes a law in the lok sabha and in the rajya sabha and even secures the assent of the president but it is not notified in the gazette occupying the same field over which the state legislation in maharashtra prevails the supreme court holds that once parliament has made that law repugnancy arises and the maharashtra law will be held to be void 
it doesn't matter whether parliament has in whether that parliamentary law has in fact come into force or not that is the uh, ruling of the supreme court in state of kerala versus marappuram court now over the year, years and i want to sort of wind up with a <clears throat> with a consideration of the judgment of the supreme court in vijay kumar sharma versus the state of karnataka which is 1992 scc page 562 where as i said right at the beginning there's been a conflation of this idea of repugnancy and this idea of competency the supreme court has seen has tried to bring in this test of fit and substance into this doctrine of repugnancy and that has led to some amount of confusion the challenge in vijay kumar sharma was to the karnataka contract carriages acquisition act of 1976 now this law was enacted under entry 42 list 3 entry 42 list 3 deals with acquisition of property now through this law there was a prohibition that was imposed by the karnataka government on the issue or renewal of licenses to private operators the petitioners before the supreme court they said that this karnataka law conflicted with the motor vehicles act of 1988 which is of course a central legislation which is made under entry 35 of list 3 which deals with mechanically propelled vehicles including the principles on which taxes on such vehicles are to be levied now how should the court have tested this the court should have first looked at the motor vehicles act seen whether it is a law on which parliament was competent to make a legislation seen that it is attributable to entry 35 list 3 and then first said yes the parliamentary law is intra vires the constitution in so far as competency is concerned then next it must have looked at the karnataka contract carriages acquisition act seen whether it is attributable to an entry in any of list 2 or list 3 over which the state government has competence then it would have seen that it is validly made under entry 42 list 3 and then said yes the karnataka law is intra vires the constitution thereafter it will have to see whether the karnataka law and the central law occupy the same field whether they can operate together so that is how it has to logically flow but what the court wound up doing instead is really quite curious what it said was that the doctrine of repugnancy arises only when the two laws are made on the same subject matter contained in list 3 if it doesn't belong to the same subject matter contained in list 3 the court said the law occupied two different fields and then it used the test of fit and substance to hold that the karnataka law pertained to entry 42 while the motor vehicles act pertained to entry 35 and therefore there was no repugnancy so the court then said that the karnataka law only incidentally encroached on entry 35 of list 3 and therefore it could not be said to be repugnant to the motor vehicles so what we really have is two contradictory laws operating together and you can see the kind of confusion that this is likely to brought and this is not the intention of the constitution's makers nor is it nor does it flow from the text of the constitution it should not matter the question of occupying the same field matters only in so far as repugnancy is concerned not in the question of competency so the supreme court really in this vijay kumar sharma's case has conflated these two tests we don't know if you know there will be some, and, and it has been since applied by the supreme court in other judgments in some cases it has cited this judgment but still applied the test properly in other cases it has followed this judgment <clears throat> effectively by conflating the two tests of repugnancy and competency but what this kind of will lead to is the operation of two contradictory laws together and we don't want that and this is the entire reason why article 254 exists on the uh, exists in the constitution's text <clears throat> i'll uh, conclude with that uh, thank you very much if you have any questions i'll be happy to answer So that it seems that you are not otherwise well. You are just taking up the toss. You have some cold and flu or what? Ah, uh, yeah, just a com- uh, throat issue. Not uh, anything serious, but uh, because I was saying that. Okay, this is by Abhishek Sharma. Where the legislation, though enacted with respect to matters in their allotted spheres, overlap and conflict, and where the two legislations are with respect to the matters in concurrent list, and there is a conflict in both the situation, will the Parliament Legislation predominate by virtue of the non-obstant clause, or how? Yeah. So the in so far as the first issue is concerned, that is when parliamentary law made under List One 
conflicts with a state law made under list two, we don't have to look at article 254 clause two at all, or the proviso. We only have to look at article 254 clause one. There is some textual issue there, but broadly what happens is in those cases is that the parliamentary law will have to prevail. So long as they're both competent, the court will first look at whether they've been competently made and then it will note that there's a repugnancy and then it will have to say that the state law in so far as the repugnancy is concerned is void. And if the state law cannot survive at all, then it will be totally void and it will be effectively impliedly. But in matters in list two, sorry, list three, what happens is that if the parliamentary law was already existing on the books of the, uh, on the statute books, then a state law that is made in the, in so far as matters concerned, the concurrent list is concerned, if it obtains the assent of the president, it will prevail. But in cases where there's a state law already prevailing and parliament thereafter enacts the legislation, then it's governed by 254 clause one and the parliamentary law will prevail by effectively this applying the principle of implied repeal. Which I spoke about. And uh, since we have been discussing a lot of bits and substance, uh, could substantiate uh, how do you apply the doctrine of a pith and substance in yeah, uh, <clears throat> pith and substance is basically, as I said, like you have to look at the true nature and character of the law. So let's assume there is a law that is made for, uh, we can even take this Karnataka example. The Karnataka law broadly dealt with the uh, issue of acquisition or nationalization of certain kinds of uh, vehicles. And in, the con in this, while dealing with this issue of nationalization, it incidentally encroached on certain subjects over which the Karnataka government might not have had competence to pass a law. Uh, and, <clears throat> assuming it, and assuming it did make that incidental encroachment, all you have to see is what is the true nature and character of this Karnataka law. If its true nature and character is to nationalize property, which the Karnataka government has competence to do under entry 42 list 3, then that is what in pith and substance the law is. Let's take another example, the money lenders uh, example that we spoke about at the beginning. Now, as we saw under the Government of India Act, insofar as promissory notes was concerned, it was the federal government that had the power to enact legislation. But insofar as money lenders was concerned, it was the provincial governments that had the power to legislate. So what do the provincial governments do? They brought about a legislation that said that where a <clears throat> decree is obtained, in so far as a debt is concerned and that debt having been acquired by an agriculturalist and that debt having been, um, uh, <coughs> uh, having been sort of emanating out of a promissory note, then a court will have the power to scale down that debt through a decree that it passes. Now that law in pith and substance deals with money lending. There might be some incidental encroachments that it uh, makes into the idea of promissory notes, but that would not matter. So we only have to look into the true nature and character of the law and nothing more. Now, either if, if it may, and as I said, in fact, it doesn't even matter if it's an incidental or a substantive encroachment. As long as the law in its true nature and character conforms to an entry in a list over which that particular legislature has competency to make a law, that will suffice. Yeah, this is by Naveen. How can a state law overcome a law made by a parliament? If the parliament is competent to make without getting presidential approval, as per article 254 sub clause 1, it doesn't matter whether the state law was made before or after. The state law will be revived by even a reenactment without president's approval. No, uh, this, I was only referring to uh, state laws made under the concurrent list there and not state laws made under list 2. If uh, I gave the impression that it applies to both, then I'm sorry. But it's only state laws that are made under the concurrent list where they can reenact it and get the president's approval and cure repugnancy by the application of Article 254, Clause 2. Since we once talk of concurrent list, uh, there are some young lawyers also. Uh, just substantiate what would be a concurrent list as such. Concurrent list is all uh, items that are contained in list 3 of the 7th schedule over which both parliament and the state legislature has competency to enact. 
and uh, you have to look at the three lists in Schedule 7 in conjunction with Article 246 of the Constitution. As I said in the beginning, Article 246 broadly stated, so far as matters in List 1 is concerned, it's just Parliament that has the power to make laws. This will have things like Defense of India, Foreign Affairs, Communications, etc. In so far as matters in List 2 is concerned, it's only the state legislatures that have the power to enact. Agriculture, public order, police, these are all matters that fall within List 2. And in matters in List 3, which is the concurrent list, both Parliament and state legislature has power to enact. One example which I gave was acquisition of property. This is by uh, Abhishek uh, Sharma. With a situation where the courts are charged with the duty of interpreting the enactments of the Parliament and the state legislature, such as manner in which they uh, to avoid the conflict. If the conflict becomes avoid unavoidable, how will it enact? Uh, I mean, courts, as I said, all of this is a matter of construction. So the courts will have to look at the various entries and then thereafter see whether, I mean, in terms of a competency of a legislature to enact, try and see what the true nature and character of the legislation is and see into which entry it fits. And that's the job of the uh, higher judiciary, whether it's the high courts or the Supreme Court, to uh, interpret the constitution and to interpret statutes and to read statutes in conjunction with the constitution. So the moment a question of competency arises, uh, the courts will have to undertake this job. Now, of course, if there is a conflict and if there's a possibility to resolve that conflict without striking down a law and without holding a law to be void, the court will choose that option because there's always a presumption of constitutionality that applies. And which is why I refer to the judgment of the Supreme Court in M. Karnanadi's case, where the court said that so long as the two laws can operate and there is a, the ability for both the laws to operate even in the same field, then we will, I mean, then the state law will not be void. So it's all a matter of, and, but courts will also have to take a commonsensical approach in cases like this and try and see if it's possible really for the two laws to operate together. If they can't operate together, then the state law will have to necessarily give way. Uh, we don't have any other questions, uh, Surit. So it was a session which gave us the insights on a topic which while we are studying in the law, law schools or colleges and universities, this is an important aspect. And even otherwise, we see, even as a while you are practicing lawyer, that this aspect of federal structure may not be used as such, but doctrine of revocancy does uh, is a part of a lot of litigation where you try to find that as to whether the state action could prevail or these the amendments of the state which they are trying to do are relevant or not. So uh, thank you, Surit. Uh, it was a session quite engaging. Uh, and despite the fact that I have been able to see that engage, that your health is not the best I'm of fine, the health. I'm so fine, sir. Just a throw. I'm okay. No, but be that as it may, the, uh, the way it should be. But uh, insofar as the reflecting of knowledge and giving us the insightful tool to an entire aspect of this federal structure and repugnancy uh, has been quite uh, fantastic. We are all thankful for, from all the participants who are watching us live on the Facebook, as well as on this platform, and those who will watch us on the subsequent on the Beyond Laws CLC YouTube channel. We are all thankful for you for giving us the insights to this topic. Thank you. And Thank stay, you. Everyone stay safe, stay blessed. And tomorrow at 5 p.m. we have Mr. Sirinivas Raghavan on the part three of the Motor Vehicle Acts. So do stay connected with us.